Hello Internet, Seth Skorikowski, and today we're going to look at the classic AD&D adventure, The Village of Hamlet. Written by Gary Gygax and published in 1979, the adventure then got a color cover in 1981. Fourth edition gave it its own reprinting. The Village of Hamlet is the first part in the Temple of Elemental Evil series, which was finally released in 1985 with all the materials finally in one place, which is the version that I've had for a few years now. It's had a sequel, a novel, and even a video game, and is regularly listed as one of the greatest adventures of all time, and it all started with this 16-page module, The Village of Hamlet. Being an introductory level adventure and released at the very beginning of AD&D, the module has served as kind of an introductory and first adventure for an entire generation of players. In fact, it was my very own first adventure as a player almost three decades ago, and I can still remember with a lot of clarity what the maps looked like, and I could draw most of the maps from memory, and I could tell you where figurines were at certain places, and a lot of minute details about it because it made such a huge impression on me. Wow, so this was it, huh? The first adventure that you ever played. That's right. So, how'd you do? Did you win it? I died. You died? You had mentioned in a different video that you lost the use of your arm due to a giant rat. You never mentioned that you died. Yeah, the rats were early on, and then with some magic and a long story, I ended up getting better, and then I still ended up dying at the end. But I did learn a valuable lesson to never split up the party. Wow, I can't believe you kept playing after that. You know, so many commenters have said that PC death on a first adventure is guaranteed to chase people away from the game forever. I know, right? I guess those people are just wrong because I died on my very first adventure and I had a blast. I couldn't wait to get back to playing D&D &D, and the Village of Hamlet made such a huge impression on me. So that's what we're going to talk about today, both the good and the bad of this classic adventure, as well as tips and Game Master suggestions on how to run it. Now, because there have been several new versions and updates with the various editions over the years, I'm only going to discuss the original module T1. Yes, most of this review will apply to the other versions, but we're only going to discuss T1. Obviously, of course, there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, if you've never played this classic adventure, but you want to experience what's been a rite of passage for almost 40 years, you should stop now. But send your Dungeon Master this way to see if this might be something that they would want to run for your group. Okay, Dungeon Masters, let's dive in. As I said, The Village of Hamlet is a classic adventure. It was one of the first out there that dealt with having a village as sort of the center of attention, and it was a trailblazer that deserves a lot of respect for what it accomplished. That being said, I don't think it's that great. I think that what came after it and followed in the trail that it blazed was far superior, it was better written, and it was much easier to use. The village does come with a handy map. Of course, DMs wanting a prettier map can easily find one with a little Google Foo. Being so well loved with various editions out there, there are a lot of choices for prettier and color maps. We also get several layouts of the various buildings around the village, which is awesome. Even the local tavern has a price guide for the food and the drinks that they serve, as well as tiny details about what sort of dishes they're served on. Unfortunately, this attention to detail isn't very consistent. Almost no one in the village is named, leaving that completely up to the game master to do. A few of the important NPCs are named, but not all of them, such as the village elder. The module says it does this so game masters can personalize it, but personally, I prefer to be spending my brain power trying to customize the other things around the village for my player characters, instead of having to waste it all trying to come up with names for all of these NPCs. And if I wanted to customize their names, I could go ahead and change the names that were already there and do that all myself. So Dungeon Masters, name all the key NPCs beforehand, and even some of the non-key ones. That way you've got a good old list of names. That way when the players ask you, hey, what's this guy's name, you get to drop a beautiful, well-crafted name that follows all the linguistic rules of your world instead of, you know, panicking under pressure and throwing out the first name that comes to your mind. And now everybody in the town is named Bob. Two of the local NPCs, a pair of heroes named Burn and Rufus, live in the tower. And I suspect that they were favorites of Gygax, like former PCs or something, because a lot is dedicated to these two guys. In fact, they're in almost every picture of the village of Hamlet, even photobombing these workers here. Also, the numbered locations are described by what they look like rather than what they are, such as the local inn. The local trader is noted as a wooden building with shutters and many windows. And then there's the cabinet maker and all the others. 
This is a good technique for when a PC first approaches a building and the Game Master can say what it looks like before the player characters know what it is. The problem becomes as the game goes on and the player characters are all like, hey, I want to go back to the traders. Now the Dungeon Master can't quickly flip back to the traders because there is nowhere in there that just has in big black letters, traders. So Dungeon Masters, write out a key for yourself that's got all the area locations next to what the area number is, such as number 7 is the inn, number 13 is the trading post, etc, etc. Put this list up somewhere really easy to see, such as a post-it note up on the back of your Game Master screen or somewhere else for easy and quick reference. Also, some of the information in the model module is located in weird places that aren't very intuitive, such as the note that the trader is selling bogus holy water is mentioned in the section about the church and not mentioned in the part that describes the trader's shop where you would expect something as important as that would be noted. The scenario opens with a long-winded background and info dump full of tongue twister names. And really, the only thing here that the Dungeon Master needs in the opening paragraph is that the area is ruled by a Viscount that the characters are not going to meet. The background then continues, talking about the Temple of Elemental Evil that once plagued the area and all the terrible things that happened. However, the module tells you none of that stuff, for which it makes it really difficult to share with your players when you're trying to roleplay. In fact, it simply tells you that you can learn more in the next module, which by the way took six years before the next module came out, and that is a long time to wait. And so much of the adventure relies on the temple and even knowing where the temple is that it can become very difficult to use the village of Hamlet if you don't have the second adventure, which once again took six years before that came out. And this wasn't some ancient incident that happened long ago back when everybody's great-great-grandfather was a little boy. No, this was just ten years ago, and many of the residents that are currently living in the village of Hamlet remember those dark times. So you think the module would give some sort of information that the residents could then share with the player characters, but it doesn't. This feels like one of those movies that only exists as a setup for the sequel of that movie, and then spends the better part of a decade before it even gets around to releasing the sequel. The heroes begin the adventure as they arrive in the village of Hamlet, seeking adventure and fortune. My suggestion that instead of just opening up with them walking into town, have them come in with a specific purpose. Maybe they were guarding a caravan that was destined to their homlet that was bringing you know, supplies for the trader or the castle that's being built or something like that. Maybe have the PCs fight some bandits or little monsters on the road leading to town. That way you can give them a little bit of taste of action and have the heroes kind of form their bond as you know companions in combat. It also gives them their first in for meeting an NPC in town. If they're going to be running supplies to some location, they get to meet the NPCs at that location once they arrive in town, rather than just dumping them in this town and having them have to walk up to the first person they see. No, they have a reason that they have now met this person, and that can then make it easier for them to meet the next person and the next person after that. Well, here we are in the legendary village of Hamlet. What rumors and beautiful adventure hooks are we going to find here? None. None. No rumors or adventure hooks. Nope. Other than the history and the information about the temple itself, which you need the second module in order to know any of that, there are no hooks in the village of Hamlet. We do have a few NPCs that are listed as being spies for the Temple of Elemental Evil, but no one knows that the Temple of Elemental Evil has actually started resurfacing and becoming active again, so that doesn't really lead you much. I find this part extremely annoying because there is nothing that actually leads the PCs to the second half of the module, which is the Moat House. I think the module just kind of assumes that the player characters are going to hear that, hey, there's this abandoned moat house that nobody's been in for 10 years, and there's probably nothing there because we wiped that thing out. And the PCs are going to all just you know, jump up and get on their horses and ride out there because, you know, they're heroes, and evidently heroes just charge out to explore every abandoned building that they hear about. So my suggestion here is to add some hooks and mini adventures while the player characters are in the village of Homeland. Have some goblins nearby that they have to fight, or maybe some monsters that are attacking all the livestock, and let the PCs go around town and start developing a reputation and a name for themselves. Then have a reward that gets put out on some bandits that are roaming the area. These could be linked to the bandits that they fought at the very beginning if you decided to use that idea, and now you can find out that no, there's actually a big gang of bandits that's operating around here. And then eventually, between different sightings, or maybe interrogating prisoners, or just having a ranger that can do some tracking abilities, the PCs can figure out that the bandits are making their hideout in the old moat house ruins. 
that not only would serve as a great way to inform them about the Most House existence in the first place, but it gives them a quest, and the quest is to rid it of these bandits. That is a much better form of motivation for your characters than simply letting them go, yeah, guys, you know, I heard there was an abandoned moat house outside of town, and yeah, sure, there's probably nothing there at all, but since there's nothing else to do in this crappy town, you guys want to go check out a moat house? The moat house, to me, is the real adventure. I've used different variations of this moat house in my own homegrown games over the years, and while the old black and white picture is really nice, DMs can find much nicer color images as well that they can then give to your players. The same goes for the map of the upper level. A couple image searches will yield some pretty color versions that you can use. Inside, they'll fight some giant rats and giant frogs and some other low-level giant animals. They're also going to find a group of brigands that are hiding in the back room. If you use the idea that there's highway bandits that are terrorizing the roads, you can just use these guys' stats as all the highway bandits, and then just say that the nine that the PCs find here are basically the last of this bandit gang. Now, if the player characters look too powerful or things don't go their way, the brigands might flee out a collapsed wall that's in the back of their hideout. So they've reinforced the front door to their hideout, and it's now locked and very difficult to get through, but the back is just a big ass hole that doesn't even have a screen door blocking it, which is kind of weird, really. Now, since there is a direct opening that leads directly into their lair, I'd add some different traps around this spot. You know, snares, punji sticks, maybe even some bear traps. That way, any PCs that are trying to enter this way or chase any fleeing bandits as the bandits are trying to run away, they're going to be in for a nasty little surprise. There's also a spiffy dungeon that's below the moat house. Once again, a little Google Foo will find much prettier color version of this map. You'll find some of the standard beasties in here. Undead, gnolls, bugbears, and even a giant crawfish. One thing that I find amazing is that the ogre has a name, Lubash. Not like the PCs are actually going to talk to this ogre or anything, but they decided to name him. But meanwhile, his humans and his known prisoner that the PCs are definitely going to talk to once they set them free, yeah, they don't have any names at all. Now one idea is to have these prisoners that the ogre has be locals for the village of Hamlet that recently went missing, and the PCs were then sent out to find these missing people, once again giving them a reason to find the moat house in the first place. They're also going to find some agents of the Temple of Elemental Evil here. There are several guardsmen that are all being led by a 5th level cleric named Lareth. Their symbol, by the way, is a big flaming eye, just like the Eye of Sauron. This symbol is really the only thing that differentiates the brigands that are squatting up in the upper level from the agents of the Temple of Elemental Evil that are living down below. And it seems a bit weird to me that the agents of the temple would even allow these guys to be living up there. These guys bring unwanted attention, and it doesn't make much sense that you would have both bands of these people living in this very small place as if they don't know about each other. So my idea is to make the people that are living in the upper portion, the brigands, to be hopeful initiates that are trying to get membership into this temple. You can add some sort of altar to their hideout, or maybe even signs of sacrifice, or tithing, or self-flagellation, or something like that. Maybe give them similar tunics to all the people that are living below, but they don't have that fancy burning eye thing embroidered on it because, you know, they haven't earned it yet. This turns the presence of the brigands and the supposedly abandoned building not to feel as random, but more as sort of an ominous sign that maybe this cult is growing and expanding. Now, there's no mention of any reward that might happen if the PCs slay the brigands or the guardsmen or Lareth. So, once again, if you put some sort of bounty out for some highway bandits, that can give them the monetary reward, and then maybe come up with some sort of reward that they can get if they come back from the moat house going, you would not believe what we also found down in there. There is also no mention if Byrne or Rufus are going to be interested at all in learning that there's people wearing the symbol and they moved into that moat house. You also have to get the second module for all that information, meaning that once again, you only have half a module here. However, the module does mention that if Lareth is killed, his agents will try to figure out who did it, and then send a 10th level assassin to murder the PCs. Holy crap! 10th level? We are so screwed! Exactly. Once again, this module is intended for novice characters. The big bad is only 5th level, and a 10th level assassin is going to make quick work of them without any problems at all. Overall, I find the village of Hamlet to be pretty lackluster. While I love the maps and I love the floor plan, the scenario's layout and its plot is pretty lacking, and a dungeon master is going to need to do a lot of work in order to flesh this whole thing out. 
Being that this is a game that's designed for novice players, it's very likely you're going to be looking at a lot of novice dungeon masters as well. And once you scrape away all the layers of nostalgia and the praise that it does deserve for being so groundbreaking at the time, the module just feels incomplete and is not dungeon master friendly. There are a lot of good ideas here, I've stolen many of them for my own games over the years, but if I was going to recommend a novice first edition adventure, I'd use one of the adventures that came out after this and improved on what the village of Hamlet created. Specifically, I would go for the Cult of the Reptile God, which does have its own issues, but the cult infiltrating the town is much, much better. Secret of Bone Hill, which has a great town with a lot of little side adventures in it, and Sinister Secret of Saltmarsh, which entirely lacks the village from which it gets its name, but has a great first level adventure, all of which I have reviewed by the way, so check those out. And also, running the Assault Marsh adventure, if you're going to be doing uh, Bone Hill as the background, that is a killer combination. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. If you want to see some more of our review videos or other things such as RPG philosophy and Game Master Toolbox, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, players, you have a great day. You know, you missed a golden opportunity to mention the village of Omelette. It's like Denny's, you know, but in the D&D &D universe.